Good evening, everyone. And, and we very much welcome you to what's going to be a wonderful webinar tonight. And we want to thank you for joining us wherever you are. But before we hear about embracing intercultural education, um, I want to acknowledge our first storytellers, our First Nations Australians. And I, I want to acknowledge as well that their centering of story and the creative arts at the centre of their um, knowing, doing, being and becoming has so much to um, offer us and we have so much to learn. I also want to acknowledge that um, their land was never ceded, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. I'm joining from Darug country. The University of Sydney stands on Gadigal land and you might like to acknowledge the country that you're joining on in the chat. I'm Robin Ewing and with uh, Professor Michael Anderson, um, I co-direct the CREATE Centre at the University of Sydney. Creativity in research, engaging the arts. We, we are really um, focusing very much on the relationship between creativity and the arts and education health and well-being and tonight's um, webinar will be recorded so if you would like to listen to it again or share it with others um, you'll be able to do that at, at your leisure if you haven't let, yet joined create we'd encourage you to do so and um, yeah um, think about whether there's something that you would like to offer um, in a webinar or <clears throat> learn about some of the other things that we're doing. It's my great privilege tonight to welcome Maria Labutsina, Robin Maloney and John De Noble from Macquarie University. We're going to hear about embracing intercultural education. And I'm going to ask them to tell us just a little bit about themselves before they launch into their presentation. My understanding is that we're going to hear a, a lot about the importance of, of our teachers learning about cultural and um, critical intercultural skills using the creative arts. And I think that's um, something that um, all of our pre-service and experienced teachers need. Um, an understanding of. So over to you, Maria, Robin and John. Thank you very much for um, being there and for a great opportunity to share our ideas um, and insights with you. Uh, my name is uh, Maria and I work with Robin and John at Macquarie University. Uh, the University of Sydney is my alma mater. I'm a graduate of Sydney University. Uh, and my main focus in my research um, is inclusive education. I have also been working um, in Finland on uh, comparative research, Australian and Finnish education. And also I'm very interested in the question of um, innovative strategies uh, in the area of intercultural teaching and learning. Thank, Thank you. you. Hello everyone, I'm Robin Maloney. Um, I spent many years in schools as a secondary teacher of modern languages. Um, my languages <coughs> were French and German and then I added Japanese um, and I loved that. And but then I did a doctorate um, <coughs> on primary school kids into cultural learning in language learning. And um, with that, I, I moved to teacher education at Macquarie and did 10 years of that. And I love that as well too. I think teacher education is very, very significant as we all do um, mm -hmm. for social change. And um, now I'm retired and uh, writing. Uh, I'm really, really enjoying doing a number of books for teacher education in schools. 
Thank you. And hi, I'm John DeNoble. I have the pleasure of working with Robin and Maria at Macquarie University. Um, I uh, My background is also in teaching. So I was a secondary trained teacher, uh, but became, well, actually middle school trained, but became a primary school teacher because that was the first job I got. <laughs> always thinking I was going to you know return to uh, secondary teaching at some point but I love primary so much that it just became my career but I taught in um, schools that were highly EALD that was highly diverse uh, ethnic populations 70% uh, or more uh, students from, from different uh, backgrounds and so I had that experience but um, the reason why I was drawn into this work and and the work with uh, Robin and, and uh, Marie was of my experience with values education and uh, in particular doing quantitative analyses of values and attitudes and things like that it just became so um, I became very interested in what they were doing too through that and what we could do together so that's uh, that's why I'm here and uh, I'm very happy to be here and, and share what I know about interculturality later on. Okay, I just noticed that um, Terry is joining us from South Africa. So welcome, Terry. That's wonderful. <laughs> okay, well, over to you three to, to share your work with us. Thank you so much, Robin. And I'll uh, go to share screen. So this is um, our focus for tonight. And I would also just like to add my own acknowledgement of country um, <clears throat> and the <clears throat> acknowledging the traditional custodians of all the lands on which we sit uh, tonight. Uh, and um, and for me in Sydney, that's the land of the Gadigal people, of your, your nation, and I res pay my respect to their elders past and present. Uh, and I'd also like to... Um, extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples here in our presentation today. And I especially acknowledge um, the artwork of Benaya Brooks, um, who's part of my extended family, and she's from Mardu, uh, Mardu people in Western Australia. Um, and um, she's only 18, um, but um, I... Uh, very proud to use her work with her permission in our slides. Um, uh, tonight, we're just going to do two things. Um, tell you about what we did and what we found in working in five schools in intercultural work and to, in the process, to stimulate everybody's critical thinking about their creativity in their teaching and research uh, and for you to find your connections with your work in the, on this uh, journey. This is the book that was the outcome of uh, the, or the, the writing up of this research project. And uh, we think it's a pretty good little book. It offers quite a lot. Um, and as you can see, it's practice and research and the practice comes first. So it's actually a very practical little book and it's part of a series um, it was actually the first book in this series um, by Fred and uh, Fred Durvin and Mei Yuan in um, in <coughs> Beijing. And Fred Durvin has been a bit of a guru of mine and influenced quite a lot of my uh, work and projects. Uh, what's in the book? Uh, it's it's um, a, a nice, neat little package of a research project, but written for use and with very clear outcomes in good practice in schools, in improved practice in classrooms and schools. It actually has the whole details. One chapter is the uh, professional development course. So schools um, could pick it up and actually run the PD themselves. And of course, it focuses on how our five schools responded to a PD intervention that we ran in the schools. Um, it's uh, as a part of its research profile, of course, it offers quantitative and qualitative data analysis. And then from the teacher perspective, and perhaps from your perspective also, 
it importantly includes lots of examples of the actual projects that teachers came up with as a result and as part of the PD. Very friendly writing, um, not an academic article genre. It's very friendly writing because we wrote it largely for teachers and pictures and also taking into account that the three of us are from different backgrounds. So to be true to our intercultural genre, we have to acknowledge that we came to the work with different perspectives and different backgrounds and different methodologies and so on. And it is sitting there on Amazon and Booktopia at um, you know the usual academic price range. This interculturality word um, is a bit of a stopper for some people. Um, it's, it's, it is from the work of Fred Durbin, although of course other people are using it too. Um, it's meant to capture a more holistic idea away from that, that original idea of intercultural competence as a bunch of skills and um, things that could be measured. It's meant to represent a holistic process of development about inquiry, critical thinking, um, uh, and development, a process that can include failure, and it's individual and, and unfinished uh, a process still in development. Um, and of course, for us, it's sitting in the Australian context, Australian school context, where we wanna make a difference in combating racism and in building engagement with reconciliation. Um, you'd all be very familiar with old, this old iceberg. It's a bit overexposed, this analogy but it's still very meaningful and a really good idea of visible and invisible culture. And we're all very good at the visible culture, uh, which is, you know, always the easiest <laughs> to focus on in things like Harmony Day and Multicultural Days, your food and festivals and fashion and, and all that. But it's this invisible culture under the surface that is a really interesting stuff. Um, and um, the, the fine print uh, of this is so interesting. All these things like body language, conversational patterns, emotional uh, ways of expressing emotion, courtesy and manners, all these are so interesting and important in people's lives and kids' lives and in the, what they bring to school and how they view um, education and, and the content of the lesson. So that's um, what we are really interested in. Our rationale, of course, for this project are probably obvious, but it is widely acknowledged that inclusion and anti-racism initiatives have gone off the boil in school. We know that schools are still a place where kids experience racism. And on the, on the counterbalance, we know that now um, in the Australian curriculum, we have a, a, a mandatory cross-curriculum capability called intercultural understanding, which is wanting to draw attention to these processes. But um, uh, this project in Victoria from Deakin Uni, the work of uh, Hulse and so on, um, really found that teachers are willing and wanting to engage with this sort of work, but anxious and confused about it and really not um, confident in where to start. Uh, so our research questions were just simply, can we make a difference? Can we find the attributes that will make a difference in teacher interculturality and can we develop a model? This is the bigger picture. Can we develop a model which might be reliable and useful to others? It's not a situation where one size fits all at all. Inter interculturality has to be negotiated for the individual context, but perhaps there are some teacher attributes that um, can help others with this work. Um, our methodology, um, 
uh, it's a mixed method study with both sorts of data. Um, we conducted a pre and post uh, survey instrument of teacher attitudes and beliefs and, and approaches. We delivered uh, a three hour um, professional development course in the schools, which involved a 10 week follow up. Um, and of course, we um, analysed uh, both sorts of data. When we went back after that 10 weeks, we held big uh, interviews with the teachers and um, that provided some really important qualitative data as well too. So our five schools uh, were, were diverse in socioeconomic status and a number of other factors in Sydney's, uh, they were all Sydney schools, so it's, it's um, you know, an East Coast relatively privileged um, study, I suppose you could say, but they were very, very different SES wise in the West and the East and Northwest and altogether 160 teachers, which isn't a bad um, sample. Uh, various ages, variable years of work experience. And some schools also included their non-teaching school staff, which was really great. Um, I guess you could say there were five steps in our process with teachers. So this is now focusing on the intervention, the actual PD course. The very important first stage, and this is whole staff, a whole staff, <clears throat> Um, PD situation. The very first stage is personal reflection. And uh, so we told our stories, we did some preliminary work, and then we asked the teachers to think quietly about a time or an incident in which they learnt more about themselves through an interaction with someone else or some other group of people. And that could have involved failure or success or learning or new directions. Um, it was quite a challenging uh, demand to place on teachers and some were comfortable with it and some were less comfortable with it. But it's very important to access that raw material, even if it involves some discomfort, that can become productive discomfort. And we said, okay, that's our raw material. If we've had a bop through some personal experience of learning something new about ourselves um, through a language and culture interaction, how do we replicate that? How do we produce that in class for kids in the classroom context? So we, we show them some examples um, that have worked and that we've collected from other schools. Some intercultural work that involves critical thinking, new knowledges, um, new discoveries in a range of subject areas. Scaffolding. <laughs> uh, then we uh, ask them, we give them time to work in very small groups to design something for their classroom, a twist to a unit, a new focus or a new perspective to a lesson, a unit, whatever they like, or um, something for the whole school, something new to do with the corridors or the playground, or looking at the signage around the school, something in the whole school context. They can choose. And then they had to actually implement it. They had to work a bit more with their partners and actually carry it out in order then for us to come back in 10 weeks and for them to tell us about it. So they were going to observe any changes that occurred, all those sorts of things. Um, so it was a, a demanding a program, if you like. And on that second step where we scaffolded examples. I just thought I'd mention, I think the most important part of those examples was these disruptive questions that you're probably familiar with. But does this content that you're going to teach in maths or science or HSIE, does it have any kind of global history? 
have other cultures contributed to this topic? Are there other types of practice globally or locally or in the kids' families to do with this topic? Um, can we look at practice in the countries of origins of where the kids have uh, moved from? And together with that, then what are my assumptions or limitations in regard to this topic? Are there things about it that I don't know that I can honestly ask? And especially all the time, how can I elicit how can I elicit the knowledge of students and their families um, that will enlarge this topic for the whole class? Uh, so just a, a few examples in science. We look at this wonderful, this is primary school, um, but this wonderful new book by Corey Tatt, who you might be familiar with, The First Scientist. And it, it is the first Indigenous uh, scientist of Australia in many of the science field. It's a wonderful book. And I know it's in now getting to be in a lot of schools. And... Um, uh, uh, yeah, Corey Tutts will, will know and find. Or to take something like in the PDHPE, the concept of a park. Who and, and what is a park for? Is a park understood the same way in different countries? And so we can compare the many, many interesting things that happen in a park in China, where a park, the word for park, translates as public space. Public space. Um, it isn't just a place for kids. So that concept that um, uh, things can be understood, of course, very different in different um, contexts. And in mathematics, um, different number systems from different countries, or how about experiencing the world with a base three system, which is relatively common. Base three and base five are relatively common in many Aboriginal languages, um, where mathematics serves the needs of a particular community and imagining what those would be. Just a few ideas. And um, then I'm going to hand over to John to talk about the analysis of the, da the data that was collected and what it means. Thanks, John. You're welcome, Robin. Doing great. <laughs> yeah, so um, with 160 teachers uh, doing a survey, we had adequate data for uh, for analysis. And uh, we had um, devised a survey. Uh, Maria did a lot of the hard grunt work with that. She had located a lot of items representing the different constructs we were trying to measure, as Robin had as well. But also we wrote some ourselves because there were gaps. In a literature review, we found that there were certain uh, attributes that we wanted to to, to test and see if they actually existed. And we found that in some areas like uh, whole school um, issues, uh, such as use of space, um, we had to actually write items and then get some help making sure that they were clear and all that sort of thing. So a little bit of checking uh, from, from, from other experts uh, to make sure. So this, the survey was uh, was given as a, as a pre-survey before Maria and Robin then went to the schools and, and did the professional, um, professional learning experiences. And from that initial data, uh, we factor analysed their responses to all the items in, in, in the survey. And uh, what we ended up with was the uh, was the model, which I won't talk to just yet. I just want to talk a bit more about what we did. Um, so the model emerged from that. Um, what we then did was actually, after the uh, professional development happened, we then gave, invited the teachers to do the survey again uh, in the light of the professional development. How have they changed? Have they grown? What's happened here? And so what we're able to do, we didn't have to factor analyze again. We were able to then measure using um, the the items clustered in the in the constructs that were, that had emerged in the in the analysis in the table, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, and we were able to then compare the first and the second responses and see if you know what change had occurred. There's the interesting part. We wanted to know if the professional development that Maria and Robin had spent a lot of time developing actually had an impact on these teachers. And of course. We, we, our assumption and our rationale, as Robin said earlier, was if we, if we can influence these teachers uh, about their practice, 
we're going to have a much better educational experience provision for these students. They're going to be much more informed about interculturality, about other cultures and their place in the world and all the rest of it. So um, that, that was really important. So um, to, to get all that data was important, to test the change in schools was important. And then, of course, other than the quality, quantitative analysis, Maria and uh, Robin then went into the schools to look for the evidence of all of that. So I'll go to the next next slide, please, whoever's, whoever's in control. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> oh, okay, so this is good. So I thought I'd just... Um, the, the, the basis of the quant, I just wanted to, I, I provide this straight out of the book, actually. Um, it, it sort of says everything that I'm going to now clumsily try and say now. But uh, I'll, I'll start by saying this. Yes, we tried to measure these things. We tried to measure teacher beliefs and attitudes in relation to interculturality. But, you know, on my shoulder, I know that not everyone will like that idea in sociology and in the, and, and you know, this is within the field of sociology, right? A lot of people don't like measuring because of the subjective nature of the concepts that we're trying to measure and that one person's tolerance is another person's intolerance and so on and so forth. So there's so much stuff, but, um, what we took, or what I took with our analysis was a post-positive approach where, yes, we're measuring things, but we're keeping in mind that this is, when we produce these results and talk about them, that this is not the universal reality. This is the reality for this group of people. And as Robin said earlier, it was down to the individual schools. You know, we weren't trying to generalise to, to everywhere. It was a New South Wales-centric uh, study, of course. But the implications are relevant to people outside and everywhere. And so, uh, and the other reason why I thought this was important was um, I, I, a lot of my research has been quantitative and use of statistics and all that sort of thing, not by choice, just the topics I choose. And I hang around with a lot of post-structural academics uh, and it keeps me honest. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean by that is they're always reminding me, you know, this, this, this statistical stuff is good, but, you know, when you get into the shoes of people, when you, get, when you, when you try and empathise with situations, that's where you find the truth. That's where you find all the, all the nitty-gritty, the bones around, uh, the meat around the bones. And so I like to call the quantitative analysis the bones and all the things that Maria and Robin saw in the schools is the meat, all the things the teachers said to them about their personal experience of growth or otherwise is the meat. That's what I'm talking about here um, in, in, the, in terms of post-positivism. And there is a school of thought around post-positivism that says this is the way forward because you can do these things and still be informed by qualitative approaches as well, which is why we took a myth, mixed methods approach. Okay. And this is the model, da -da! so that that emerged from the 160 teachers. Um, some of them, uh, some of these uh, the, these attributes we sort of expected, and some were not quite so expected. It was interesting, interesting um, situation. Uh, just to be quick, so um, for example, positive disposition and um, and. Uh, yeah, positive disposition for intercultural and intercultural efficacy. We kind of expected those things to emerge because we'd seen them in the literature. Right? Um, but tolerance of interculturality was a little bit of a hmm, thorn there. So it was unusual because in our items, we had tolerance or, or concepts to do with tolerance across the many constructs that we were measuring. Right? We, in our literature review, came to the view that tolerance sort of actually underpins interculturality. So it wasn't a construct on its own. It was an underpinning value and principle uh, across. And we had, of course, the Australian values, national values to, to back us up on that, you know. Um, but no, the responses by the 160 participants their, their responses to the items that had uh, tolerance um, involved in them were very similar. And this emerged as a very strong construct on its own, as, as a strong factor on its own. So we had to um, we had to recognise it. And then once we looked again at the literature and had a real close look, not just in education, but in other contexts, we soon realised that tolerance 
is something that's that that is talked about on its own it is a factor that people actually investigate and measure and and, and so on and so forth and so there was really perhaps um an accidental fortunate thing to happen that you know we by doing this by doing the factor analysis we actually caught something that we would have missed if we just gone in a priori with all our assumptions and just measured teacher attitudes without the factor analysis and i think that's a very important thing to state with this that the the the, the seven attributes that have come through are actually empirically derived we didn't just think oh we'll just measure these things we actually tested those things came up the, the the factor analysis spat out these seven um attributes and of course they were statistically sound as well and we're able to then measure using that um so that that's uh, uh, the other thing about this uh, seven attribute model is we found that um three of them were to do more with teacher attitudes than anything else that's the top three there uh, but then the other three were not really attitudes they were qualities inherent in the people uh, something that maybe someone had learned or something that was in them part of their uh, part of their makeup uh, and that was the efficacy which is the confidence to teach into culturality the personal experiences they'd had growing up and in young adulthood including experiences in other in other cultures and the global perspective them feeling that they're part of something bigger than just the local area and the school-wide support was a blending of two um two areas that, that was school-wide it was all to do with space really um so that so that was that one so we've got attitudes qualities and supports the attitudes and qualities were the teacher aspects of it and of course the school factor was the support and so we we what we're trying to say with this model is it's not just the teachers that make interculturality happen in schools it is the school itself supporting by the administrate administration and of course the way the place is um the way the way the schools use the space and all that sort of thing so that's the seven attribute model. And those are the seven things that we compared. Um, and then this is an example across all of the schools that we studied, all five schools. <clears throat> Pardon me. So we can see um, on the, uh, the table on the uh, left hand side, I've just abbreviated all of the, all the constructs. Sorry about that. Um, so positive disposition tolerance uh, of, of interculturality negative disposition to interculturality intercultural efficacy personal experiences global is global perspective and school-wide support the negative disposition just by the way um to uh, to interculturality was something that we had caught in the literature and it actually came up in the in the factor analysis as well uh, our expectation was that after the professional development the negative disp disposition towards interculturality would reduce uh, and you can see here that uh, in overall it did but but not in every case there was some there was some um, there were some uh, furfies in amongst uh, among the schools but generally speaking there was growth in the areas where we expected to see growth and you can see that in the change statistic right in the middle of the table there um and you can also see um a d measure third from the right which is cohen's d which is the same measure of impact that john hattie uses to measure the impact of different teaching pedagogies and all the rest of it i use the same statistic to show the growth in each of these attributes pre and especially post the professional development and some of the growth was quite significant quite large now you can see there uh, intercultural efficacy was quite a large amount of growth but in some of the schools the growth was in individual schools this growth was even larger than that um, you can see a graph here of what happened across the schools generally um, schools increased in the in the attributes except for negative disposition that went down a bit and that's that's to be expected if you're trying to actually generate a positive disposition uh, the next slide shows us one school in particular i think it's benton public school of course pseudonyms were used no all, all the innocent are protected here in our studies so you can see here some interesting uh, results you can see on the graph for, uh, as a first up that negative disposition disposition went down quite uh, the change was large and the cohen's d the, the amount of uh, the the strength of the change was strong as well and uh, that was a good outcome for that school um, but you can see there was massive growth also in a couple of other things global perspective 
was one. So the, the growth there was 1.25. Uh, positive disposition to interculturality grew by almost one, D of one, which is very strong. Um, and these results indicate that the professional development in some schools in particular could have huge impacts on the teacher growth in their attributes, especially in positive disposition, especially in the reduction of negative disposition. It'd be a real worry if negative was strong and positive, eh? <laughs> they should cancel each other out, right? Um, but also uh, in, in um, what was it? Efficacy, intercultural efficacy, and, and the personal experience part of it as well. So that was that was one example in the book. Um, we do present for, for uh, the other schools as well, and the growth figures are quite impressive as well in there as well. We thought we'd show that. What we then did is we took those, um, those results and we regressed them against each other. We wanted to know if one affected the other or was correlated with the other and impacted the other. And so I won't go, I won't bore you to tears with the statistics there, only to tell you that when we um when we multiple when we regressed, um, and we took each attribute had a turn. So we'd start with intercultural efficacy and we'd get all the others and regress against it and see, okay, was there, did any of these attributes predict intercultural e efficacy or have to do with the growth in intercultural efficacy? Um, what I found when I'd interpreted all the numbers, I had to draw a picture on a big A3 sheet of paper to figure all this out. What I found was that positive disposition which is a predictor and a, and a co-predictor of many of these uh, many of these attributes, is what you have to work on first if you want to successfully professionally develop teachers and grow their attributes in interculturality, and so that needs to come first. You need to work on that uh, that quality. Um, that actually then goes hand in hand with tolerance of interculturality. What you're trying to do here is change the school culture or enhance the school culture so tolerance froths up to the top all the time and and you professionally develop it in that area as well you professionally develop people that then has wonderful impacts on the profession the personal experiences the global perspective and the school-wide support uh, what tends to happen is administrators administrators tend to sort of see what's happening and then try to support things that are happening the personal experiences uh, start to come to the top a little bit more because the um you know if you're working on positive disposition and tolerance all of a sudden you're giving them a, a, a personal experience that's positive towards interculturality but also the realization the realization that of a global perspective that is oh i'm not just a teacher here in western sydney i'm part of a bigger thing and I need to address that bigger thing of interculturality out there and give it to my students. They need to become citizens of the world just like I'm becoming. That's what the growth in global perspective is all about. But our research says you can't really do that well without starting at positive disposition towards interculturality and then working on tolerance. And that to me makes perfect sense it's a logical thing and all the statistics we're doing was just showing that yes that that is true <laughs> okay and I think that's everything I had to say in terms of the quant part of it I think the next slide is is all Robin if I remember correctly over to you Robin thank you John uh, I, I reflect on that more each time that you've done that presentation and it's actually I'm thinking about it more deeply each time in relation to the process. <laughs> so thank you. Maria, I think you're going to go from here. Uh, after the initial workshop and um, our, all our teachers were volunteers, so they have formed groups uh, working on their selected projects. So we were back to our schools 10 weeks later and there were some um, commonalities, uh, some trends that have emerged as soon as we were back uh, to these very different uh, schools. And one of the emerged uh, trends was the importance of um, whole school in the cultural approach. So the school leadership previously, according to uh, teachers' interviews, uh, was some kind of a distance. There was a distance between the school leadership in terms of intercultural strategies and teachers who were coping, struggling, or um, 
working on their own intercultural strategies. When post our workshop, post um, the, these projects, uh, the teachers have reported that suddenly they have realized how important is the whole school approach, that there, there's one unity and all the strategies could be shared, uh, could be um, used across different age groups. And that was um, this point of what we called critical awareness of intercultural, uh, new intercultural strategies. Uh, there were 38 learning projects uh, that were finalized and shared. And another aspect that was um, revealing, uh, there were teachers seemed to follow multimodal uh, approach. So all these different projects uh, were in different modalities from uh, audio and video recordings, some visual data, more traditional um, narrative summaries, art competitions, uh, towards uh, probably a bit more academic uh, writing. One of the teachers uh, inspired by um, the workshop and by uh, the projects, she has produced the whole unit of study based on indigenous history and shared with her colleagues. When we were working on um, teacher group interviews and um, analyzing their projects. We have uh, followed uh, theoret our theoretical framework was based on the works of Biesta in terms of um, development of dispositions that new dispositions that we saw and what have John have, has just emphasized. So we saw this emerging, emerging new dispositions uh, that became the way to relate to self and the other and the broader world uh, to the extent that there was a sense of awakening of um, confidence and seeing yourself as a teacher or as a group of teachers as part of the global perspective in one of the schools which was um, situated in a very low socioeconomic area uh, when we came back after, our, after the projects were completed one of the projects was a huge map of the world uh, displayed in the library with a tiny red dot. And the teachers reported proudly, we show it to our students, this is where our school is. So our school is part of the big world. So they physically, visually has pointed out that's where we are and that's what our sense of belonging that has changed. We also based our theoretical framework on the ideas of Bakhtin, Mikhail Bakhtin, and his ideas um, of dialogic perspective, that we need the collision of different voices uh, in order to uh, develop new ideas, new beliefs and values. As he said, two voices is the minimum for life. And that would lead us um, and our participating teachers to the idea that there are many dialogues. There is no one way in uh, facing and developing intercultural strategies. So there were different perspectives and the teachers have shared openly uh, their different perspectives and different voices. Regarding uh, commonalities across all the projects, uh, some of the major um, common trends included teachers reported feeling now that they were also learners and students became uh, their teachers. So there was this sort of across um, intercultural um, education when students were teaching, also sharing some of the um, traditional family values, uh, some of uh, language uh, concepts. And on the other hand, that will lead students, primary school students to this discoveries that teachers also have the limitations. For the first time, some teachers said that for the first time that were feeling they have this feeling of transparency because usually as a teacher, you do not really reveal your limitations to your students. When this idea of intercultural limitations, I don't know this language, I can hardly speak um, second language. Beca it, transparency became um, the strength and teachers will share their multicultural identities. Students were really, it was a revelation for many students that their teachers were born outside Australia, born overseas, spoke different languages at home. 
And uh, one of the major trends that have emerged was the importance of visual and performing arts, uh, many opportunities for non-language based expression of self, of sharing knowledge uh, that became one of the major trend and uh, major strategy in developing this new, um, new way of intercultural communication. These are some examples, uh, just some of these examples of new projects. In the area of performing arts, um, we had a project called uh, Multilingual Superheroes, when junior primary school students had to interview their parents, their grandparents, and uh, perform in their classroom. In, they would imagine, introduce one superhero, and the superheroes will speak different languages, languages of this particular school, from Korean to Chinese to Italian. Uh, this uh, made this experience very much alive and very close uh, to students' hearts, because suddenly they have realized that how many different languages can uh, superheroes speak, but also can their fellow students speak. Also, there was a concept of dance, and it was a very interesting decision made by a school um, that they didn't want to introduce, there were many nationalities, students of different ethnic backgrounds, but they have selected only three uh, dances uh, to rehearse and to perform, indigenous, Indian, and Greek. And therefore, students of different uh, backgrounds would join one of these groups, which will introduce this idea of sense of belonging because they were united by this, for a while, by this Greek culture. Uh, and they had to do not only the actual performance, but part of the task was to do some research. How did this dance emerge? Uh, what are the specific characteristics of this dance? And students were involved also in this critical research investigation prior to the performance. Uh, there was a very, in, I think, very engaging um, in terms of broader community. One of the projects was based on reaching out to parents, grandparents, broader school community, when students had to, uh, for 10 minutes, uh, in front of the assembly to perform a song or a short verse uh, in front of all the students, teachers, and invited parents and grandparents. Most of the students are second generation. Uh, so they obviously made mistakes uh, when they were performing a song, for example, in Korean. And interestingly, the parents felt at the beginning were very, they were not very comfortable. They were invited, but then they will laugh, then will start um, softly correcting the students. So it was this unity uh, through this performance of a short song, for example, the unity that will um, unite parents, students, and teachers. And that was the project that is, um, has been, became part of the school, uh, school ritual, school tradition. So once a month, uh, there is this performance and students are asking teachers whether they could do this. So the idea of stage fright that was very present at the beginning now was replaced with students volunteering to do it. And uh, two, teachers of, um, who came from India, they came with another idea, bringing together not only performing arts, but sport as well. They remembered their childhood games. Uh, they asked their relatives in India. So they have um, taught their students this games, childhood games from India. And uh, the students were, again, this idea of um, vulnerability. Students have realized suddenly that these teachers had um, their childhood, favorite childhood games. It showed the students a totally different aspect of teachers' lives. Uh, thank you. And uh, visual arts uh, played a significant part as well in um, most of our projects. Uh, one was um, obviously one, some were more traditional like multilingual welcome signs um, in many schools, but also uh, there was a project mapping teachers' lives. Where do the staff come from? It was a huge poster and teachers were invited, some were anonymous, some were revealed their names about their experiences. Were they born 
overseas? What were the experiences traveling? So they were just short glimpses and that was displayed um, near the um, reception. So students were again learning about the, the teachers, but teachers themselves said we had no idea what a broad, rich cultural context do we have in our school. And that was, that was they would owe it to this uh, huge poster. Uh, there were garden design projects. And again, that was this visual feast, uh, not expected because students had to produce garden plans uh, for um, their home, for their home languages, um, garden in Korea, garden in China. And there were so many um, desi beautifully designed plants and drawings that a classroom was not enough. So the principal made this decision uh, just to decorate the whole school with this artworks. So for a month, they had this they were celebrating this diversity. And they um, became to plant a garden after the exhibition was over, an indigenous garden in one of these gray, uh, dull areas of their school. But I believe one of the most important projects that had a significant impact on students' mental health issues, depression, anxiety, was a multicultural photo collage. Uh, that was the project designed by teachers in one of the schools in low socioeconomic area. It was a large school and uh, one of the teachers um, confessed that the area itself was considered a transition area. So migrant refugee families coming there, if you're successful, you will leave the area. You will go to live in a more expensive part of Sydney. If you're not success successful, you will also leave this area. So you will go further. Um, so that was this very much, you know, transition point. And many refugee and migrant students uh, were had issues. They were lonely. Uh, they felt isolated. Uh, there were many cases of children's depression issues. And a group of teachers came with this idea as a project. Uh, we will display again a large collage with photos of new arrivals. Uh, wearing their national dresses or some kind of national costumes in, with a short uh, stories about them, with their names. And then we will um, update it every month. And that was one of the most successful projects because teachers shared with us that now these children, isolated, not confident, suffering from anxiety, for example, they have found friends. They became the school celebrities because all other students would suddenly recognize, oh, I know this face, what an interesting story uh, behind this uh, person. So that was uh, a huge increase in students' well-being just because of this visual art uh, project. And um, there were many other uh, projects that will all bring this idea of students' welfare, students' well-being, and also creating more in-depth connections between teachers and students. May I also ask just a few examples of our visual examples of our projects. So you can see uh, there was this marriage before between uh, visual arts and performing arts, the superheroes project, and the very moving uh, image saying hello, designed by students, the tree of life. Uh, with their names in different languages or students uh, who have painted the school, the whole area to celebrate one of the um, festivals, Indian festivals. Thank you. Um, and I guess just to add a, a perspective on those uh, projects, um, a, a, quite a number of the schools picked up the idea of, of of using their spaces in new new ways, using their corridors, their doors, their um, their playground, um, their assembly hall, um, to to represent the identities of kids, and especially here to acknowledge to have some visual acknowledgement of whose country does the school stand on, to find out something about the history of the um, indigenous uh, country that the school is standing on. That was a very important thing that was picked up in most of the schools. Um, and just that sense that whole school 
culture sense of the impact of the school buildings, of the school space, uh, visually on all kids' experience of being in the school, all the things that make up school culture and shape the kids' uh, experience, their well-being and their achievement um, in, in, in being in that school. Um, the, the last thing that was mentioned in the little descriptor of tonight's session is that we were going to mention um, the uh, couple of case studies, two of the chapters of the book, but I'll just very briefly mention one. And I think uh, this school has already been mentioned. Um, it's the, we called it Gaines uh, uh, Primary School, Public School, um, where it, there was really quite a remarkable outcome uh, from very negative, low expectations of, of, uh, of their school in, on the teacher's part, to something new happening and new, some new perceptions of what was going on there. So, um, yeah, it's got the very, very high Labote um, measure and uh, a staff, a very diverse staff, 66% uh, 66, 66 of the staff actually spoke an additional language. Um, but that linguistic diversity was not uh, applauded or recognised as part of the school's identity. It was just there as part of that negative um, self-identity of, oh, yeah, we're 96% we're, we're Labode um, and the, the negative uh, associations that sometimes go with that. The, the, the area has a history of negative media attention and the need for urban regeneration strategies and so on. Uh, interestingly, with that linguistic diversity, the school website, this is an, actually all that uncommon, the, the, uh, the invisible multilingualism. It makes no, uh, the website makes no reference whatsoever to its multicultural and multilingual setting, which, you know, we would love to see this idea being picked up by more schools, that they have this wonderful diversity um, as a huge asset and as a part of their identity that they can do creative things with. Um, uh, so in this school, there were some surprises in the teachers themselves, not just research surprises, but surprising discoveries that the teachers made. Um, they actually had to question some of their assumptions and knowledge of students, right? Know your students. They actually discovered things about the kids um, and increase their knowledge of the kids, of the diversity. They, they were really surprised by the kids' enthusiasm for having, for example, in mass, the currency of their home origin countries included in mass, like talking about different currencies and the fact that mum and dad had some of the currency from their country of origin at home, or doing measurements from instead of from you know Sydney to Parks, uh, measuring the distance between two two cities in the country that they were from. That's not appropriate for some countries of origin, I know, uh, but uh, little little things meant so much to the kids. They were so amazed to have something close to them and their family or their knowledge included in maths, in science, in HSIE. And the teachers were very surprised at that. Um, and uh, yes, so for the very first time, following on our example prompt, um, we encouraged the teachers to use the school's multilingualism as a catalyst for new teaching ideas. So you saw the evidence of that in those examples. And the teachers, again, were very surprised at the positive outcomes. Um, so, you know, quotes like, oh, they were so happy. They asked me, when are we coming back to do some more of this stuff? That was actually chalking the playground in geometric patterns for Ranguli, for the festival of Diwali, um, Indian festival, um, which is a mass uh, crossover, mass creative arts activity um, and in the case of the bilingual books 
uh, that parents yeah. were so excited that they were included in the bilingual book creation, which is a complex, a very complex task linguistically, um, not a simple thing. Um, and the teachers were in the in the big staff meeting after the 10 weeks, they were very enthusiastic in reporting their projects to each other, but also in these unexpected outcomes. And uh, there was a strong feeling that they were all contributing to a pool of new knowledge about each other and their students and their school and themselves. So um, there were those, you know, some strong intercultural outcomes. And the just the last thing to mention about this school, that Maria's mentioned this mapping exercise. A couple of, of the schools did these mapping exercises. And, uh, uh, but in this particular school, which is, you know, from this, negative self-perception, there was this surprise when they saw the complexity of this map and the strings and all the countries that the kids had come from. Oh, we can see um, the whole, the rest of the world from here and that all roads lead to Gaines. That's the pseudonym name. So we thought that was a lovely, um, like all roads lead to Rome. They, they had this impression, oh, we are some kind of epicenter here of all these kids and their creativity and their possibilities. Um, and uh, we like to think that Gaines is perhaps uh, every man, it's every school is a Gaines and has this potential to, to discover this creativity and this inclusion. Um, and just to finish, um, I guess the, the point of this is just to throw out the challenge to you. Uh, I, I know your centre uses the word transformation a lot, and it's a wonderful word. Um, uh, so we all, all of our teaching, at whatever level we're teaching at and whatever our discipline is or our teaching context, um, we, we all challenge ourselves with these questions. What assumptions are we making? Um, what are our biases? How do we change in interacting with our students? And then simply in university classrooms, do you know in your tutorials, do you know who speaks a non-English language? Do you know who's multilingual in your tutes? Um, do you know who might have knowledge um, uh, and perspective to bring to this class? Um, and this might seem so obvious, but talking to university students, um, they've told us in, <laughs> in other projects, nobody has ever asked me at uni whether I speak another language. I've been through the whole uni system and never once been asked that question. I think there's a growing awareness in um, doctoral supervision of different knowledge bases, different educational system that students are coming from that must be respected and acknowledged and, and um, promoted. Um, and uh, and uh, 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 together with that, the diversity in epistemologies and ways of writing, I think is growing in respect in uh, supervision. Uh, I'll invite your comments on those in, in a sec. And uh, yeah, just just to to finish with that challenge, I guess um, uh, of of whether you know it's it's what we'd like to see for all tertiary teachers and of course all school teachers to to have either written or in their heads some sort of self positioning check <laughs> for embedding diverse perspectives in in all our work, our teaching, and our research projects with an intercultural lens like we've seen working here in these schools. So open to questions, responses, whatever you like. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much, Robin, Maria and John. A comment from Terry from a long way away. She said, no small challenge, but necessary and important. And thank you for that comment, Terry. It's been such a well-researched, an exciting and engaging project that you've um, shared with us tonight. 
and heartwarming. It's so <laughs> pleasing to see the creativity that you've encouraged in those educational settings. Um, is there someone who would like to ask a question? Just because there's quite a few of us, if you'd like to raise your hand or wave or something for Robin, um, Maria and John. There is a question in chat from Susan. Um, I'm curious about whether teachers in the second interview shared noticing of shifts or changes in school parental relationships or community sense of identity as a result of the changes they had implemented? Um, the school where they had invited parents to the assemblies uh, and the school where they had involved parents in the bilingual book creation, certainly in those two cases, um, the schools provided feedback to us on the um, excitement and the inclusion that that generated. Um, in the bigger aspects, we would, we would, we, what we would really like to see, I think, in the bigger picture is, um, and this is like, this isn't in the classroom, but I think there's a, such a huge area where, for example, office staff, uh, the office staff and, and school staff need to take fresh eyes on the complexity of many of the tasks that they ask parents to do. Um, the, the linguistic difficulty of many school processes, such as enrolment and paying fees and all the many, many notices that go home. Uh, I think that's an area of, of great need that only a relatively small number of schools are critically aware of. And the other thing, of course, is um, uh, expectations or, or hopes that parents will participate in um, parents and citizens association ways of contributing to the school. Um, you've got different cultural expectations uh, where in many countries, parents aren't expected to, or, or you know, uh, expected to contribute. And so there's a reluctance, there's, um, uh, there's, that's another whole area, I think, that needs a multilingual support. Um, but I guess in our little <laughs> corner of the world, we weren't able to address all those things. Thank you, Robin. And Terry said she has amusing or a comment rather than a question, but I'm sure you'd like to hear that as well. Um, thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating. So the only context I know is the South African context, um, which, as we know, is a very problematic and has a problematic and complicated past. So I was just thinking about the extent to which the school system in the country sort of values um, equality or egalitarianism in the way that it's structured. Um, the extent to which that is held would would determine the success of a project like this. And the reason I ask is because our school system in South Africa still largely represents the very poorly named education system during apartheid, which was called the Bantu education system, where there were different curricula um, set up for different racial groups with the idea of um, basically allowing white people to access high profile jobs and then people of color to more work in more blue color more blue color jobs and that has not actually properly been broken yet with the result that about 83 percent of our schools in the country are actually classed as being dysfunctional whereas only 17 percent are classed as being functional and that starts that it, it starts to perpetuate economic and racial it, it just keeps those cycles going because they've never actually addressed that that very structural problem so i'm just wondering to what extent you would need you were speaking about the importance of the school in realizing this, but to what extent you'd need actually the whole school system and the belief of the whole school system to, to work together in realizing this. And then I was also just thinking around language. So we've got 11 official languages in South Africa, English representing a minority of the people in the country, but all of our teaching is done only in English Afrikaans. So those are the only two um, languages of learning or teaching that you can learn in in South Africa. 
So we've got the vast majority of our country learning in a second or third language. So it's it's just really interesting things I was thinking about with that. One of the things that we've started to do, I work at the University of Cape Town, that we do in our tutorial groups is we try to get tutors, well, pretty much everyone speaks more than one language, but we try to get tutors who speak as many languages as possible. And then you do your conceptual work. So you break into partners with someone who speaks your home language mm -hmm. and you do your conceptual thinking work in your home language and then feedback in a language that everyone in the class can understand. So more just thoughts, but such amazing, yeah. wonderful work. And I think, Robin, I think you were saying it's the, the small things that make such a big difference, like the currency, it really is that. It's just being seen and acknowledged shifts so much in the classroom. It's wonderful. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sherry. That's a fantastic collection of, of, of comparisons, of thoughts, of, of impressions. I've just spent a bit of time in January in Israel and Palestine, and um, uh, some of what you've said is reflected in, in those two very different education systems there too, yeah. I, 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 Maria and John might like to comment, but I think so much in the, the Australian school system, so much depends on leadership and the principles conceptualization of the school and the modeling of the expectation of success and the expectation of positive outcomes for all children and that's an easy thing to say and I know it's not always borne out in reality um, we also have kids uh, uh, legions of kids um, learning uh, in their uh, English is their third or fourth language, including many, 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 many uh, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander kids for whom English is a school only language. Um, uh, yeah, uh, Maria and John, you like to say anything to Terry's comments? Yeah, I think, I think uh, sorry, on, on paper, there's an on paper thing that we have to be, and it's been for a long time in the Australian school system, you know, of being culturally aware and all the rest of it. But uh, as Robin says, I've, the schools that I've taught in and also the schools that I've walked into, it's the principal that has the biggest impact on whether that happens or not. And unfortunately, when you've got a large number of principals who are of a certain background and don't generally reflect um, the population of the school, there are, there are potentials for things to get missed, not intentionally, they just get missed. Oh, so um, anyway, that's what I'd say. <laughs> Over to you, Maria. About the school leadership, in some cases we came across, let's say, the principal who was not very involved, but the school leadership, the deputies were the driving force behind the whole changes, especially in the more multicultural schools. And I think that's another indication that the school leadership probably, um, even if the principal is not uh, very much engaged in intercultural developments. There are always, uh, you know, the deputies who also can contribute uh, largely to this. So that was one of our observations and findings. Uh, and also, I think another finding was that um, the, those principals who made an effort to engage with a broader community, for example, with them um, in one of the school's cases, Korean Association, extra time, on behalf of the principal, but it will pay off because this associations, uh, ethnic associations would become involved and will largely contribute uh, to school culture, to very positive developments. In one of the schools, the whole orchestra instruments were donated to the school. So every, um, during the morning tea, students will perform. So it's just an example that financially the school benefited only because the principal took this next step, took this effort. I'd like to thank you all for um, participating in this tonight and especially Robin, Maria and John for this wonderful presentation that I'm sure many more people will listen to um, in the coming days. And thank you again for sharing this with us. It's really wonderful to hear about your work. Thanks so much, Kathy, and thanks everyone for your interest. And good luck to everybody in your work. Thanks, Terry. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much.